Thanks for downloading and listening to the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and engage with various visual storytelling topics, making things, drawing things, uh, designing things, programming things. Uh, we think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and a teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, I am Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience designer and a game designer. Hi, Rob. We're back. We're back. We, uh... We've got the normal show keeps it keeps on rolling, right? But then we did our we finally did that experiment with the, uh, you know, doing a a, a rebroadcast episode. Yeah, last yeah. week. Yep. I hope everybody enjoyed that. You know, that trip down memory lane. We'll be doing that again in the near future. Well, in the, in the future, I should say, with uh, different mm-hmm. playlists and um, different dips into the archives as as it seems appropriate, right? Um. Hmm. But but here we are, not a dip into the archive, back for another show. And what are we uh, doing this week, Rob? Okay, so this week is about taking a look at and puzzling the situation of um, side hustle, side gig, side project. It's got a lot of terms, but it really is, um, you know, chances are you've got a, your main thing, and this is your thing you want to do, but it's not your main thing. But Give me an example. Here we go with uh, let's uh, let's say most web comics or <laughs> uh, lots of indie games or hmm many Etsy shops many like so you you can take a hobby and have an intent to profit from it especially but like I think it doesn't have to be that um, but then you sort of that that gives you a set of challenges to like how do you how do you make this work sustainably? And okay, then, so do we need to stipulate? Yeah. Do we need to stipulate at the top that we're specifically talking about something that um, we're hoping will eventually provide more revenue, or no? Does that matter? It doesn't have to. It's just it's it's worth thinking about though, because that's part of your intention for this this project. You're engaging on this endeavor for some kind of desired outcome, hopefully, right? And or maybe you're like, I don't know yet. But at least um, know that you're exploring, and so then that's the intention is to explore. So, but it's it is an extra effort. It's it's in addition to your other other things. I mean, you're writing a book, you're you know making a graphic novel or what have you. But then you pr- maybe you're a graphic designer for for you know um, for an interactive agency, or you're uh, an analyst at a financial company or whatever you are doing like during the day, or you're a, a, a parent and you're, you're full-time caretaker or what have you. But then in addition to this other main commitment and whether or not you, you wish to engage in profit with it, um, maybe you want to build your resume and it's pro bono work supporting something you really believe in and you're making that choice, right? Mm. Whatever it is, like that's, um, you know, it's a side thing side thing and okay mm-hmm. so what do you mean by sustainable before we dive into uh, on the ground and really dig into this conversation i thought we made a good, good idea to like preface this a little bit like what do you mean when you say sustainable i think it's it's easy to find and imagine whether you know you're you're doing it implicitly or explicitly the the sort of well if i'm doing this i must you know run uphill all directions. This is going to be super hard and I'm probably not going to get much sleep or what have you. But I, with big asterisks, um, saying maybe you're at a life stage where that works for you, right? Or your sort of natural situation, your, your genetics or whatever, you, maybe that's no problem. But I, I'm saying that sustainable, I think means for many of us that thinking of the emotional, physical, social, toll or tension that a side project can can introduce and your desire to participate in it and and make something happen with it and that those the sustainable angle or as or or the things that come out of that 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 lens of saying well now i don't just want to like engage in an art challenge one day one week one month this is an ongoing lifestyle thing how do i keep this as a healthy part of my lifestyle and not that we're doctors or anything like that, but, you know, sharing anecdotally from, you know, bumping into, um, maybe don't let this happen to you sides of this, uh, (laughs) (laughs) 
exploration. Um, I, I, you know, okay, so yeah, can I preface this by getting a little bit like uh, the, the poetic stuff that I like to dig into whenever I oh, talk about this stuff? Beautiful, um, yeah. There's the, I think the a style of our show is that we don't like to point out paths because, um, at least for me personally, I, I'm... I, I'm very romantic about the idea of like there is no way or path and everybody has to find their own way or path because that's where the adventure really is. But by mm -hmm. talking about the path we took, we can say, oh yeah, I ran into like some really big monsters over here. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to run into them, but boy, oh boy, did I run into monsters over here. And like, I really should have carried a sword when I was walking in this part and then instead of a flute. <laughs> but that flute came in handy when I crossed the next hill because then there were some people who needed entertainment, that kind of thing, right? Um telling the story not to prescribe sure. but more to help uh, provide whatever service we can in terms of guiding so yeah and kind of like um, you know building off your metaphor uh in your everyday carry bag of holding you know <laughs> how many how many flutes is too many right <laughs> so <laughs> in my day we played atari adventure where you only had one thing or another thing and you put that thing down when you had to pick up another thing <laughs> they both looked like a dot <laughs> they both looked like a dot we liked it that way mm-hmm Oh, <laughs> so anyway, but the sustainable, whatever that means for you, knowing like there's a lot of variance there, but maybe with what we share, maybe there'll be something useful. And that that's the intent is that somewhere in there, whatever your capacity, even if it's vast and amazing and what have you, we all have our limits and it's worth, um, it's worth thinking about because this, the side thing is inherently the, um, an additional set of, um, constraints and trade-offs to make it on top of your your other commitments so well with I that, find that important oh no yeah let's go yeah. oh here we go all right time to go on the ground this is where we talk about the topic like what it looks like when we're doing the thing that we're talking about like what does it look what does sustainability look like for us how do we keep our projects sustainable um and uh, then in the second half, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the more abstract aspects of this, some of the whys and whatnot. But, all right, where do you want to start, Rob? Where do you want to, you want to start with, like, tensions? Do you want to start with uh, horror stories? Do you want to start with, like, uh, the, the tools you use? I, I well, let's pick a project. Let's pick a project. We could flip a coin, and either of us can, can go from there. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. <laughs> What'd you pick? I, tales. <laughs> I have two side projects right now, yep. and one of them is my web comic, which I should say my comic, my personal comic. The comic Sorry, that's a habit. I brought that right into the podcast as conversationally. What? I know as a term, web comics are just comics, whatever. Oh know? no, that's not why it's I did that a... though. Uh, although I agree, you know, um, I, I just mean that Boulder and Fleet hasn't updated on a regular basis in, in some time. And so I feel like, can I call it a web comic? Well, it's a comic on the web, but it's all—it's just my personal comic. So it updates mm. when it updates. Um, and then, then that brings up a whole other thing that I don't want to go into is defining even what a web comic is. Oh my gosh, no! I don't because then the next thing you know, we're going to be talking about what is a graphic novel, how's it different from a comic book? Ah! And I'm screaming, I'm running out of the room. Um, but I've got my comic, <laughs> and I've got this project that I do with you, Rob. This lean into art thing. So two side projects, two side hustles. Um, and how do I make them sustainable? Um, talking about uh, Boulder and Fleet, one thing that I've done recently, and I just did, I just live streamed for my Patreon supporters, um, and I was doing the new desktop image that I just posted. Oh, I should have, I should have had it pulled up and at the ready. I just posted a new desktop on my Patreon. Let me see if I can grab it while I'm talking to you. And uh, it was yet another experiment. Um, where I was really trying to uh, experiment with tools and experiment with approach and method to make it as easy and quick to do as possible. That's not to say that I'm phoning it in, but it's like, how can I make this thing happen more and more quickly? All right? Does that make sense? Um, here's oh, the yeah, one hundred percent. Here's the post, the desktop that people can get at Patreon.com/slash/Jersey. Might as well do an ad for myself, but. I was happy with it, right? So I asked myself when I was doing this this trick or treat image. I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ink this up in Clip Studio Paint. I'm gonna color it in Clip Studio Paint. Um, oh man, this is gonna be really busy if I do it in full color. Maybe I should do it in a limited palette. Ah, if I do it in a limited palette, that means I'm gonna be able to finish it a lot faster. Let's see if I can get this thing done in an hour, hour and a half, right? 
um, Whoa. Be, because it's something where I don't have a lot of extra spare time to be, be creating extra material for my comic and my Patreon, right? So um, how can I look for ways to experiment with tools and with approaches and with um, visual styles to make it more efficient? And then, um, I mean, that efficiency kind of rolls back into my day job as a cartoonist as well, which is like another nice side benefit. But yeah, I'm always on the hunt for how can I make this go faster? How can I make this easier? How can I make this more streamlined, right? Okay, so what were what were some of the things you were you were experimenting with here? I mean, specifically, I, like I see your your you know the very the Jersey style in your characters up front. The background looks looks like a little somehow new, right? Yeah, as, yeah, yeah. So what what was going on? That was the other one where it's like, okay, well, I mean, I I sketched in the background in blue line, and then I was and I looked at it, and I was like, okay, well, again, we're thinking of this thing's going to be potentially very busy. Uh, and, and I want this to be a desktop image, therefore, I don't want it to be, you know, this thing's to be covered with icons, potentially, right? Uh, so how can I make it look a little less uh, visually busy? Ah, well, let's not put lines on the background. Let's have it just be like colors. Ah, if I do it just in colors, I can do it a little bit more abstractly, and then I don't have to break out all my straight edges. I don't have to actually use the perspective tools. I can just rough it in really rough and keep it rough. That background took me maybe... Maybe 15 minutes to do, mm. right? Um, it was very fast. Um, and, and that was intentional. That was like trying to keep this thing under budget in terms of time. Um, but also to keep it, you know, visually uh, inobtr- unobtrusive. So in producing this, did, did it cause any other tensions with um, other aspects of your project? Or like this one or other projects? Uh, well, it, it caused tension in that I wasn't sure if the background was going to work, right? Uh, I kind of took a leap of faith saying, like, well, let's just, like, roughly paint in the background. Um, and I got about about seven minutes or so into it when I realized, because I was, I was actually originally painting with different hues. I was like, oh, what am I thinking? Let's just do this in gray values. So then that way I know if it's too busy or not with instantly and then i can just throw like uh, an overlay layer on top of it that's where that tension came in it was like i wasn't quite sure how i was going to pull it off until i was like part way in does that make sense so it does i mean so it sounds like experimenting but it also sounds like um like for your project and its sustainability you're you're sort of hunt like hunting and hiring maybe where it's like is this a tech what can this technique stay yeah. and do some valuable job for me on this project. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and that, then yeah. I, at my penciling layer, uh, which I did in Clip Studio Paint, uh, I did have a brief moment where I thought about, well, wait a minute, this, these pencils are tight enough. I could just make these in inks. And then I can just do the fills, like, you know, uh, sort of by hand by tracing them out. Because, like, I use Clip Studio Paint. Another reason I use this tool is because when you ink on a vector layer, it makes it exceedingly easy to flat. Like, it took me minutes to, minutes to flat this image, right? Um, granted they're all colored in one fill color and then I just threw a shadow color over top. But, um, but I thought very briefly, oh, I could take this, the pencils and then I'm getting even more efficient. And then I can like cut a whole like 30 minutes out of the production of this thing. Um, but then I looked at the bunny on the right and I was like, oh, I did a really sloppy job on the penciling over there. And it would probably take me at least 30 minutes to clean that up. Let's just ink it. <laughs> so I just went ahead and inked it. Um, but yes, so there's a lot of back and forth of me recruiting tools, getting a, a few minutes of play with them to see like, uh, is this working? Am I getting the efficiency I want? No. All right, change change plan. Right, uh, all the way throughout. Um, and that kind of experiment, I feel comfortable experimenting like that on little items like desktop images and stuff because it's not the big thing I'm going to invest a lot of money in. This is like a free thing I'm giving away just to keep people coming back and looking at my Patreon. Hmm. Yeah, this sounds yeah, it sounds like a nice, uh, successful experiment so far. I was happy with it. I, I was yeah. really happy with the way the image turned out. Um, so, yeah. What about you? Um, I kind of have a some like two past projects to 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 explore. That um, so one of them was uh, this game project I did. Not the first game project I, I worked on. But um, but it was a bigger one. It was right around 2004. It's called uh, Jin Hanu, and it was very ambitious. 
and uh, I mismanaged the project in a bunch of different ways, but that's, um, but in particular, working on my, one of my roles was uh, one of the game engine coders, um, in addition to, you know, a lot of other hats. And I found that like when I'd be switching hats or switching gears, or even like, okay, this evening is a pure coding work session. I need to, um, like one of the pieces of tech we worked on was a, and this was built in uh, Flash. Um, and it, uh, let's see, I, it, I was working on a character bot is what I called it. And it could, it, it had, um, it was a way to animate uh, segments of a, of a character that was a humanoid that had all these placeholders of placeholder art. And then it could load um, real assets, right? So, so it, it, this, this same set of animations could actually be, you know, male, female, um, um, a, a monster, a different, like whatever the heck I wanted. And anyway, so like, I know what I'm going to work on, but I sit down for this coding session and I, I would have this big spin up time. And I don't know if it was kind of a life stage thing or if it was a sort of a, a practice switching hats day job to, you know, side project, whatever it was. But I remember distinctly, I, I needed like, honestly, a half hour would have been super fast for me to spin up and, and be productive coding. And I know I'm, I'm not alone here. I mean, there's anecdotally plenty of uh, people I've worked with and, you know, plenty of articles about how it's really detrimental to in interrupt a coder because gosh darn it, it takes us so long to spin up. And that certainly was true for me at a, at a time. And this is not a value judgment about anyone who that's, this remains true, but that project, it just was, it added this extra tax where if I only had two hours to work on it in an evening, which right now is a crazy abundance of time to work on a project, whatever, you know, different life stage. And I, I would end up spending a half hour to an hour of that spinning up but then feel this tension as far as setting it down of like, well, now I'm just, I'm, I'm cranking and I'm efficient. I'm in the, I'm in the flow state and this is great. And I'm getting things done. Oh no, my time's coming to an end. Right. And now how do I, how do I put this down? And it really, it was, um, pretty challenging in those days. I mean, finish a draft of the game, entered it into a contest, all this kind of stuff. But, um, just yeah that and many other things pl plenty of other quirky challenges that that i had and with that project fast forward to a few years later and feel free to react to any of this anytime jersey mm -hmm. um but then okay so then i'm, I'm working I'm collecting thoughts as you go yeah awesome and so then i'm working on uh in this case this panda needs you i've all i have released guitar fretter have put out multiple updates and all that kind of stuff have done various different you know, design and coding projects, many in, in, in the years in between these two projects, right? And so um, I had honed and evolved, you know, some habits where, um, let's see, when I'm about to sit down to code, uh, if it's my first session and I know what I'm trying to build, I just start getting it's a like don't let don't let there be a blank page in front of you kind of thing i start pseudo coding and i get my thoughts out and figure out how i'm going to arrange this thing or i'll start doodling and i i get traction on the problem that i'm trying to solve and i'm st let, then i start expressing it in code let's say i've already done that as far as what i end up um and I've, i'm coming back in a session after i've worked on it maybe it's been a week maybe it's been two weeks or just a day either way how I set down and stop working on something has a giant effect as far as how easy it is to pick up next time. So I started to um, keep a change log, which is a big thing of like, okay, today I, um, I did a quick experiment about loading the level and I think it's, it's running too slow and like just a couple of things. I wouldn't force myself to think of like, these are features I must build next, but just get my thoughts out about what I was working on and what I was thinking and what I did. And then <clears throat> one next session, that is a huge boost. Like it's like, um, it's like how, how much faster um, computers have, have become for starting up, right? These used to take a lot longer than they do now, much like me. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm coding and um, yeah so I found that that sort of change journal very helpful 
pseudo coding to start covering new space and uh, and also making sure I comment my code better than I did in the past where it's like this is my intent here this is what's going on and um, that combination of you know embracing code as a communication medium that that really helps me or anyone else who picks it up and sees it to um, reconnect and uh, join that purpose if they need to so and that they is typically me on my side projects um, but that was a that was a big shift and I that it's it's like it may sound like this tiny aspect of a side project but to me it makes it makes a big difference um, especially if I only have a few minutes to work on something. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, whittling, whittling is a difficult thing to get in the headspace of um, for certain parts of the process for me. Um, mm. and, uh, and, and it certainly is, is a tough thing in terms of morale, right? Like when you're, when you're checking in on a thing on a regular basis, um, it's easy to oscillate between uh, lifestyle approach to doing the work and goal oriented approach doing the work both have their value right mm. I'm doing this thing I'm checking in every day because in two years time I will have a finished thing right like like when I've done different web comics projects I've done like a, a projection like oh if I do a page a week and I have this many pages to do this is when I will essentially when I'll be done with the thing right so there is like a, a light at the end of the tunnel as it were um, but when you're in that whittling stage and that, that light is very, very far away, that can become a demoralizing thing. And what's more is, depending on what part of the work you're doing, like for me, thumbnailing is, and I, I've said this a hundred times, it's, it's, it's the, the intellectually the most challenging part of making comics for me. It's the part where I feel like all of my skills are engaged. All of like what I find interesting and valuable about being a cartoonist is all activated at that stage, but it's really hard. And sort of, if I've only got like an hour and a half and I got to sit down, I got to thumbnail like a few pages of material. Like I can usually do a page of thumbnails in about 30 minutes, uh, about changes from page to page, but that's like a, a rough estimate. Um, but getting into that headspace to be able to think about, okay, well, I'm thinking about moment choice, I'm thinking about panel arrangement, I'm thinking about dialogue, I'm thinking about pose, I'm thinking about right, character moments. How do I make the character say this thing as, as only they could say it, that kind of thing. Um, there can be a lot of spin up to get to that headspace. And the tick-tock of the time box event can make it very difficult to get there without feeling some kind of pressure and anxiety, right? Um, totally. Like this, uh, like what I've what I've shared is totally an adaptation that I don't know if it works for anyone else, right? The moment I read that, the moment you said change log, and I know what a change log is. Um, I mean, at least I'd heard the term before, and I was roughly familiar with what the concept is. But the moment I read it in your notes, I was like, oh my gosh, I should totally be doing that in my ETP. I should be collecting that information at the end of each day. This is what I got done. This is where my head was at when I did that thing. So that the next day. It's, it's yeah, it's um, some of it. It's, it's really that you have all these baked, refined, improving, ready to go, but not quite expressed intentions, right? And so instead of fully expressing them in like your medium of, of choice, then you're, you're, you're just capturing a quick narrative about it. Um, instead of being like looking at this thing of going like, where was I? Right. It's just a and, sign. It's a pointer. And, and I would, knowing how I am, I would make a note to myself to say, don't capture just the emotional state, right? Because like sometimes when it's at the end of the night, I'm like, look, I just got to wrap this up. I got to get some sleep. It'll be more like, disappointed i'm frustrated i'm at that point where i don't know if this is going to be any good right those are all things i've gone through a zillion times in a project yes that's all those are real feelings and they, they matter but what would i say to myself first thing in the morning to get me going again what would be the note that i would leave to myself right if, if another person was coming in to take over this thing in the morning what would i say to them mm. what would be most useful to give to them right i, I love that prompt yeah yeah, I'm, I'm totally going to start doing that in my ATP. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, I've been capturing little notes here and there about how I feel about things and maybe capturing a few details, but never in the sense of giving myself instruction. I can only imagine how useful that'll be. And I'll report back after I've tried it. Be, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'll be really curious to learn how that works um, because sometimes my change log would be I touch the project and that's it. 
or I ran it and it's still, this thing is still broken <laughs> or whatever. Right. But like to let, and so in some ways the change log was, at, is at least a heartbeat. So if like how, how side is the side, right? Is it truly very infrequent or semi whatever? And, and, um, I, I have, I don't know, I'd have a little text expander, you know, macro where I'm like, it just, I have a heading for every day of the change log and I'm like, here's the, te- here's the heading. So it's like date and time. And, you know, um, I, so I capture some thoughts and, you know, hopefully it's something more that reflects, it reflects me trying to give myself a boost for the next session. But, but it's not always that, um, sometimes it's just, I know I touched this project. Um, and to, yeah. for me, I don't know, like that, that, that was, that's at least somewhat helpful. Oh, totally. I can totally see that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even, and I, we've talked about journaling and capturing the stuff in our ETP emergent task planner for those who are new to the show, uh, davidsay.com. Ah. It's a, a, a time tracking thing that I've been using since 2011. Uh, and I went back and like dug up all my old ETPs. Um, and I, and I occasionally go through the, my past like year or so just to see, uh, you know, how long projects took me day to day, like different pieces of the project. So I can not just to see progression, but also to give myself a sense of like helping me um, establish, uh, I'm trying to say, set my expectations for what needs to be done, right? So I'm about to dive into penciling and inking a 40 page book, which is due at the end of October. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tight. But like I did the math, I looked at what I did last year on the same kind of project. And yes, it is sustainable. I can do this with the time that I have. There'll have to be like some different trade-offs in there, but like I, I have the evidence. We've already talked about this a bunch of times. And actually, um, if you just do a search on leanandsmart.com for ETP or emergent test planning, you'll find a lot of episodes where we've gone into this. Um, but I wonder if we could talk about a little bit about, um, I was having this discussion with a, a young author recently about jealously protecting time. Is this something that you do? Uh, carving out pieces of time where it's like nothing else can get in here. So I know that I'm, I'm protecting like this one chunk to put towards my side gig. I have, that is a, that, that's certainly a mode. That's a tool because one thing you, you know, you will need is is time and the time is a space with which you can put in effort and your skills and all that. And if you're doing the the right things in the right time and the right ways, you're going to get your project moving forward. And in a way it's like the most tangible resource to, to set aside and commit. Well, Um, and Tyler James on his uh, comics launcher podcast described it as the one non-renewable resource. Right. Um, And he was using that to explain like why he would like outsource certain parts of the job, like why he'd hire a letter or hire like a flatter or something like that. It's like, well, because like I can get more money, but I can't get more time. You know, Um, that's another way of thinking about it too. Um, I'm sure Mm -hmm. that's, Tyler's not the first person to say it, but that was one of the more, more recent places I heard that expression. Um, so something I've done, I've employed as a rule in my life is like, um, you know, I make part of my living as a teaching artist and uh, I made a rule that there are certain days of the week where I just don't teach, right? Um, this day is off limits. So I can have one day where I have like, I can, I can count on having a more than five hour block to be focused on a task. Right. Rather than like when I teach, it's like it's right in the center of my day. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to do three hours at the top of the day. Then I'm going to teach for a couple hours and do a couple more hours afterwards, which is doable, but um, it changes the nature of the work, right? It totally does. And I think a lot of this is saying, well, what you have available to you, I wouldn't, I would venture to say that if you have an intentional approach, to using what you have available to you. Um, you'll probably get more, um, more something, right? More, more skill, more practice, more output, more quality. Some like something's going to work better because you're being intentional, intentional about that time. And I I should, I should back up and say, like, I'm speaking from a place of, of a specific kind of privilege where it's like, yeah, like most of my career is in, making comics or teaching how to make comics. I, I, I totally recognize and acknowledge like there's like a lot of affordances that come with that. And there's a lot of flexibility that I have because of that. Um, 
not everybody may be in the situation where they can just be like, you know what, I don't work Fridays. <laughs> right? Hey, boss, I don't work Fridays. Not everybody has that luxury. Um, so what would you say to that, Rob, in terms of like how do you jealously guard time when... Well, I mean, that your example is super funny. I mean, there was uh, a few years ago when I was... My, my, my primary professional commitment was user, user experience consulting and, and I was independent and I did just that. I negotiated contracts where I only worked four days a week. Mm. And then I would spend the other day a week developing my, my side project stuff. So things like that, um, that invitation app that I don't think we've discussed for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, and then there's of course my, my comic art geek zoo. And that, uh, that was, that was huge. That was very helpful to have that time set aside. And that, you know, even though I was a, um, a, you know, fairly new dad <laughs> at the time and, and all that, it was, I had, I had the time during the day set aside and, and it worked, but, um, but at the same time as like your constraints are going to vary, like, it, and it could be, you know, anything in the human experience that, that you, you know, where your constraints may come in you have, we all have some kind and, and it's a matter of working through those. So over time I have become less jealously guarded of, of time except for like tiny slivers here and there. And, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's about, that's, that's my choice for the sustainability aspect, you know, being, a, you know, making sure that I'm, I'm a present father and, and husband and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and my, my, currently my, my primary professional commitment, you know, opinions are my own and all that. Um, it is, you know, it's a full-time gig. That's it. So different, different constraints. I, there are, you know, I have now that then at earlier times. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, I, I think use it. If, if you can do it, use it because that's one of the best things you can do for a project is, is fuel it with, um, structured time another a great jumping off point right here everybody wants to stop the video or stop the audio go check out brandon dayton's youtube video on how he makes a living as a cartoonist or as an artist rather i should say mm. and uh he he goes into some very opinion uh strong opinions and uh i think interesting advice on how to pursue art and he makes no bones about it. He's like, if you can live cheaply, if you can live with your parents, if you can like not have a car, he, and he's not being funny about it either. He's like, like really, like if you strip out like as much as you can to live as simply as possible, so then you're maximizing your time to be able to devote to your study. Um, it's it's an interesting thought experiment of saying like it's almost like that John Lennon song, right? They play it every New Year's, right? Like imagine not having all this stuff. What would that look like? Would you be able to pursue it? And then once you've stripped everything away, now you can start to put back the things that you absolutely have to have. Like, obviously, I'm not saying, Rob, leave your family. <laughs> no, right. I assume that, man. But uh, it's, <laughs> it, but there are, I mean, you have different advantages at different life stages. Yeah. And, uh, and also based on what you've chosen to do as you, you know, as you age, right? Right. And what kind of, yeah, what kind of financial commitments you have, family, all that kind of stuff. When when I was and, when I was twenty one, I worked as a blackjack dealer because it was like the best paying job in town. Did not enjoy it for one second. It was like mm -hmm. my least favorite job. I made no secret about that. Um, but it paid a lot of money to the point where I could afford to only work two days a week, and then the rest of the week I just worked on comics. Um, and I did a lot of leveling up during that time because I wow, yeah, that was. And I, I, I didn't use the time all that wisely all the time. I was 20, you know, 21, something like that. Um, but, you know, looking back, I was like, okay, that wasn't a terrible idea. That was like a good, good use of the bandwidth that I had at that time. Uh, that was a time when I really needed to level up a lot. So it was good that I was putting in all those hours. But um, It really is. I mean, that that's certainly a time. Like one of the things that, um, so it's kind of related to this. When, when, um, when, I, see, when I see folks at a... Um, you know, early in college, whether they're going that path or not, but they're thinking about starting a business or taking a risk or whatever, that is a safer time in your life to take a risk like that. So 
you know, not saying run off and do risky stuff, even if it's making comics at the expense of, um, I don't know, um, other, other things, but your sustainable formula is, is, is going to be yours. Right. So, yeah. I mean, for you, you figured out two days a week being, you know, doing something that you didn't like gave you this other thing, really hard trade off, but, um, perfect example. Um, yeah. for me, I was, uh, I was a janitor and I, I worked third shift and that freed me up to, to meet during the day with friends who were going to college. And I started a, a sort of a garage band, you know, business making, making video games, which turned into making websites, which turned into my career, whatever. So, you know, um, like my, yeah, my hustle was, uh, Hey, who needs sleep? And, uh, <laughs> and, and forming, forming, um, forming a business and, you know, building, leveling up, building things, failing to make a game. Um, but then succeeding in fine in building tradable skills. So lots of not straightforward there, but, uh, kind of, well, uh, yes, but like, th I think that that was worth exploring a little bit about like where you are in your life figures into the sustainability formula right this really isn't does. a matter of just get some david allen stuff and you're off to the races establish three goals and you're going right this is something where it, like it's going to be informed by a lot of factors specific to you but some things that i heard in here that we can summarize before we kick into the next section is um just tracking a few notes at the beginning or rather at the end of the day to use at the beginning of the next time the next session instructions for your future self kind of thing I think is great um, experimenting constantly to like find new efficiencies and experimenting on low risk things um, e extra projects for your side gig to help speed you up so that like those little tiny whittling sessions net more results and then also like trying to if possible um, block out some very specific concrete chunks of time and guard them to the best of your ability or to the best of your bandwidth. How's that sound? I think, yeah, that, that's a, that's a solid summary. Okay. <laughs> I mean, ugh, so many, like go ahead and like treat that summary like stepping stones and you will fall into a pit probably <laughs> of your own different cir circumstance. <laughs> and that's the but, fun of it. That's the fun totally. of it in my opinion. Um, all right. Well, in about one minute and 30 seconds, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about some more of the abstract concepts of this behind this whole thing. Um, what are we going to talk about in the next half, Rob? Well, I mean, let's see. I'm thinking about like setting yourself up for the long haul and uh, like a little more about the sustainability and the, and I mean, the 10,000 feet up is, is a, you know, maybe, maybe a little, a little more philosophical. Okay. So. We'll get even more philosophical than we just have been in about a minute and 30 seconds. But before we do that, mm -hmm. I have to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Surely everybody's heard of Patreon by now. Yes? No? Uh, what is it then? It's a, it's a way for you to provide a, uh, a monthly upvote for us. It's, it's a way for you to say, hey, you know, you guys uh, provide value to me. I believe in you. I believe in the work that you do. Here's a dollar a month or whatever you can afford. Uh, and the more people do that, the more the show becomes sustainable, the more Rob and I are compensated for our time. We want to take this opportunity to thank five people who have been voting for us on a monthly basis. Uh, and first up is India. India, you can find on Twitter at Old Swifty. India's got a new comic book out, uh, and it looks fabulous. I really do encourage you to follow her at Old Swifty on Twitter. Uh, Olivia Birdton. Uh, Olivia, thank you so much for believing in us and the work that we do. You can find Olivia at Olivia Birdton on the Twitters. And then D Jusan, D longtime friend of the show. Uh, D can be found on Twitter at D D E E J U U S A N. Uh, another, oh gosh, an amazing artist, and also a very philosophical mind. I really enjoy following and listening to her thoughts on Twitter. Owen Jolins, longtime friend of the show. Owen can be found at Comic Colorist. Two C's in the middle there. The word comic, the word colorist, all one word. Professional comic book colorist has been on the show before. Uh, and always lends really interesting thoughts in the comments on their Patreon posts. And then finally, Jesse Kaufman, at Jesse, K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. Been on the show before, personal friend of mine, and uh, 
thank you, Jesse, for believing in us and the stuff that we do. And we hope that you, too, will join them at patreon.com slash lean into art, where we post every episode that we do, along with the extra leans. The extra leans are the shows we record in between these shows uh, once a month, and it's for patrons only. And it's usually just me and Rob riffing live and kind of arriving at a topic. It's an emergent topic episode. Mm-hmm. There, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. We get a uh, little more silly, a little more, I don't know, I guess as after dark as we get, right? But uh, <laughs> it's a mystery. Find out. Uh, what does it look like when the light turns blue on Robin Jersey? Oh, man. It's called Extra Lean. <sighs> yep. But anyway, thank you to everybody who has been supporting us. Patreon.com slash lean into art. All right. Time to go 10,000 feet up. Let me pick some music to go. Well, let's Three, go class. I pick these because I know they make Rob happy. That's oh, really, good. really awesome. All right, ah. where do you want to go next? Okay, so now that we've uh, taken off up into the atmosphere, we're looking down at our, looking down at the landscape and and saying, what have we done? Um, so yeah, if you do the you you do a side project for some length of time. There's going to be like probably some sustainable or, or on some ongoing friction that that will be part of like how do how do you navigate that, and it's going to be like, um, how do you make time? So if you're are you making time during the day? Are you making time where you normally you'd be social? Are you making time where normally you would be doing other things? Right? Maybe you, you're a great um, you know soccer player or, or um, you have. Uh, I don't know, an interest in like fire juggling or something else, right? Flamingo dancing, whatever it is. But like this thing, the comic, the video game, the um, book that you're, that you're cranking on, it, um, it doesn't get done when you're doing that other thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. uh, Does this sound familiar to you? Yes, it does. I got a text from a friend, uh, a good friend of mine on September 14th, 2017 at 1042 PM. And he said, come up for air. <laughs> <laughs> when a friend gives you a signal that like, hey, I haven't heard from you in a long time. I'm worried about you, you know, but like he's known me long enough that he knows that when I drop out of sight, it's because I've got myself involved in a lot of work, all very interesting, challenging, very valuable work. But yes, there comes points where it's like, do I go out and be a human being or do I stay in to get a little bit further along with this project? Um, I recently just went to visit a, another friend who I haven't seen in almost eight months, you know, and like, I like mm. this guy a lot. I missed him, but I had to like make an appointment and like, you know, take a day out of my schedule to be like, okay, I've got this one free day. Let's do something. Right. So yes, my, my personal um, relationships are all, always uh, strained by the amount of stuff that I take on and the amount of stuff I, I'm interested in doing. For sure. Big tension. So do you find it a compounding factor that, okay, this this time set up once every N number of time that's less frequent than maybe, you know, would be preferable, maybe. And then because is there a brittleness where gosh it didn't work out this time because something came up and Mm -hmm. you know you bet um, because i and i think that that seems to be compounding with um with relationships and side projects yeah absolutely um and there there comes the uh, I, i can't remember if we talked about this in the show or if this is something we've talked about just personally off mic is uh, I find that I get to these places where I start showing up to group events and gatherings and meetings where I'm like out of breath and like full of apology. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so I'm late. And then, you know, and like I forgot that this thing was going going on. Thank you for reminding me. Oh, I'm sorry. It was your birthday. And I totally like just went right over my head because I was like involved in something else, you know? Um, and I'm not going to say I'm, I'm used to being that way. Right. But it happens enough that it's, that's the brittleness that I always think of is like this, um, it adds this tension, not only to my life, but like to my relationships themselves where like I'm not showing up fully present all the time. Um, 
I'm not great at that part, and I'm, I I continuously or continually work at it. Um, but that's that that's probably one of the biggest tensions I run into with this. Yeah, you... I, and as do I. Where I I've I've tried to shift this where where I am. Um, I'm in the state of in my in my primary relationships, right? Where when I find the time and make sure that it, there is a little bit of time or space to do this, that when I'm, when I'm in the project, I'm in the project. And when I'm not, I'm present as best as I can, as best I can be. And um, getting better at that o- over time. But then it's, the side effect is that my projects take longer. Mm-hmm. And the, the projects that I've gravitated toward um, a sustainable basis, things like lean into art, things like art and science punks, they are, um, they're in a medium that it's, I can go through a full, I like to think of creative cycles as like, um, like a no creative cycle, a small creative cycle, a medium creative cycle, and then a long cycle, right? So like a, like a no cycle is almost, it's a performance. It's a performance that it's improvisable. You're ready to be there, whatever. And the podcasts are close to that. And, and mm-hmm. it's a little bit like a, yeah, it's close to that thing. But then a little, like something that would take a couple hours, a day of effort, maybe, right? That um, like, like an experiment or doing, um, you know, practicing with, with, um, with a new painting tool and then sharing my thoughts about it, whatever. Um, a lot of blog posts, but then they're you know, like, that's, that's the, um, it's a, that's a small creative cycle where the a creative cycle for me to be more specific is the idea is thinking of what to make, how to, how to make it proceeding through, um, all the phases of like, do I need to gather ideas and then, uh, shape them, refine them, uh, revi- revise and iterate and then ship them. Right. So we'll go, go through a whole cycle. Um, which I, th- which is something I was thinking of when you were talking about your wallpaper Jersey, where that wasn't a thing where you experimented and then you set it down because I've got lots of that where I've done a thing and then I don't ship it. So is it a full creative cycle? Not really for my definition. Right. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but then longer cycles could take, you know, something that takes about a week or a few or a few months, or if it's going to take like a year or more, right. That's, that's like long cycle. Yeah. Anyway, so it's like I want to make sure that I ha- that I'm sort of allocating my time toward the more, especially for side projects like this, set, like, to get the full satisfaction of completing a thing, and I don't know, growing through that completion. I I I gravitate toward the the, the smaller end of the of the projects, and that's on purpose because I I make sure that. Um, that I guess other other areas of my life get more time. Right. So that's, but yeah, but it is a trade-off and it's something that I've practiced where um, like I have ideas for, for other projects. I get, them, I get them out and I, you know, kind of file them away and some of them I'll chip away at and sort of size up, like, could I start whittling on this one? And, you know, and sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes it's no. So like other, other side projects, games, that kind of stuff, um, future comic efforts. But, um, but that, yeah, that's, that sizing up. It's like the serious threshold for me of like, okay, is this the one, am I going to now add this to, to the, to the commitments and, and how will I, how will I work through those expectations of myself? Right. Where, um, do you have any of those, like, do you have, do you have side projects that compete with side projects? Jersey? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Where you're, where you're dealing with that? Yeah. I mean, like one of the things I'm looking down the barrel of this, this autumn is, um, Inktober's coming up in a couple of days. Right. Um, and I want to take it on in a way where I'm engaging with it in the spirit of play, but also, and this was in the rebroadcast we did last week, but also can I get an extra product. I gotta do some product development or get a product out of it as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, it's like, well, why don't I do what I did last year, which is make a 24 page, 30 page mini comic out of the deal. I did it last year, I proved I could do it and it wasn't that bad of an experience doing it. Um, And I thought, 
and then I created more content for Bolt and Fleet. Hooray. But uh, I've got this book coming out next year that my wife and I worked on called Rockets. I got to start thinking about marketing this book, right? And both Anne and I have been talking about what are things that we can create to generate interest in, you know, in the upcoming book, get people excited about it and get people thinking about it that we can slowly roll out over time. Well, uh, Inktober would be a great, a great opportunity to do like, you know, 30 rockets. You draw 30 rockets over the course of the month um, and collect those in some kind of little book that we can have on release date, that kind of thing. Um, there's, there's a tension right there. Which, which one? Which one do I do? Um, in the end, I've decided I want to gut it both ways. And I'm like, well, I'll do 24 rockets or like 20 rockets. And then I'll do like an eight page mini comic during October. <laughs> so oh my gosh. Eat my cake and have it too, as they say. Oh. Um, but, uh, yeah, competing side gigs for sure. And then um and then also I feel I, I'm reminded of an episode we did some time ago um called Web Comics to Whom Are You Committing? We did this was Brandon Dayton came on. Mm. And yeah, it was it was right when I was on the cusp of doing the Boulder and Fleet webcomic as a regular ongoing weekly webcomic. A full color weekly webcomic. And I felt the weight of that responsibility very heavily. I was like, Oh my gosh. I'm committing something that's going to be part of my life for a year or more, right? That is going to have repercussions on a bunch of other stuff that I do, right? I'm now going to feel committed to this. I'm going to feel committed to an audience. And should, the, the, I, I have thus far been enjoying a modularity in my work that I can move things around as need be. I have a few scheduled things like this show, but even this, we're recording the show on a Tuesday instead of a Thursday. Look right? at us. Yeah, see, like there's a modularity to everything that I do. And so like there's like things can get shifted into the next week and it's usually not that big of a deal, right? I send an email, I talk to some people, hey, I thought I was going to have it done this day, it's going to be done that day, is that okay? Sure, you know, most of the time. When I'm committing to something that's like a big side gig commitment where it's really about establishing a relationship and trust with an audience, it's like, can I do that? Am I going to feel okay doing that, right? When I say can, what I mean is, I should back up and say like, Am I going to be comfortable with making that statement to an audience, right? Because ultimately, what are they going to do? They're getting it for free. Most of them are going to be fine with it. Most people are going to be very supportive about it. But, right, what's going to go on in my head when I have? There's still problem? expectations that you're unboxing by doing yeah. that. You're saying, "What do I expect out of myself?" And so, if you have, uh, it's 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 a good idea. Like that, like what you what you shared right there is, I think, an important strategy to highlight that. Um, Sure. You can casually, you know, make observations about it's a side project inherently. It's not my, you know, this is not where all the risk of like how I'm financially viable or whatever. And, and it doesn't have to bear that burden or whatever you, I guess, whatever you're hoping and thinking and desiring for outcomes and whatnot, it, it's better to, to think, think of that up front and renegotiate with yourself if you need to renegotiate based on like, well, I guess I'm not going to use the, you know, a particular technique because I'm actually pretty slow at that. I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to make sure that my time budget and effort and all that, I, I'm setting myself up to succeed best I can. Or if I'm not, then I don't have expectations of really the success criteria being shipping and making money and whatever. It's, it's like, I'm giving myself a hard test because I feel like doing that. So, but I, I really helpful things to unbox, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially in, in the case, like for me, a reason that it's important to unbox these things personally is that inevitably I want these things to be more than a side gig. I want these things to become a more important part of my life. And I feel that, you know, I should be extra attentive to how I nurture and grow that thing. Right. Um, Another That's, approach could be being completely um, or, or much more uh, loose and casual about it. And if it turns into something, great. And if it doesn't, okay, well, it was a fun experiment. It was a fun thing I did just as a side thing. Um, I think loose and casual is, an, is a, is, you can snap that onto any project though. <laughs> yeah. Because you could be serious about it, yet somehow not, I mean, somehow de-escalate some of the anxiety right that i don't know <laughs> i know i get sometimes right with yeah. uh, you know I, expectations about projects 
yeah. and the commitments around them and whatnot. And uh, we take this they're moment, highly constrained. Can we take this moment to talk about an episode that we did um, that would mm -hmm. be a really good follow-up episode to this one? Yes. We're digging into archives again. Um, and we won't do a brief broadcast. We'll just ask you to like, if you, if you think this is a good start, like a really good discussion and you'd like to dig in further into it, we did episode 171, Minimum Viable Thing where like the whole thrust of that conversation was like finding like the, 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 the smallest shippable thing you can do. Right. Well, and this whole concept, like a lot of design concepts gets, you know, worshiped and then it gets thrown around like luggage. Like, you know, it, you know, one month it's the best thing. A few months later, it's the worst thing. And honestly, just taking all that aside, it's pretty darn useful to think about your constraints in as holistic of a way as you can manage. Because chances are with your skills and your strengths, you have a certain way of evaluating projects that might not be the full picture. Maybe it is, but like this whole, this, uh, that, that approach that, that we go through in that, in the episode is about looking at the feasibility. Like, can you, you know, like, is this something you're good at making? Is this something you're ready to make? The um, the desirability. Do you think there's an audience for this? And what where's your evidence for that? And then also the the viability of of like, is there a market willing to engage in trade with you? If should you have that expectation, right? And so now you can reshape your idea before you put in all this effort that's going to be not cheap, in, in your in your in the life energy you're putting into it and the time. So why not think about that up front, reshape it so it's something that that fits. So did we did we walk around? Is it is it almost time for a final thought? I think so. That can work. What um hmm. And the final thought will be the finalest final thought we've ever thought of. <laughs> so final. Stay tuned. So, so interesting, thinking. so final, so chin scratching, yet satisfying. How does it go? You're going to love it. <laughs> oh, no. It's the character. Don't make it come out. <laughs> Secret character. <laughs> okay, here's here's Easter egg. I found out that actually last week's episode, you mentioned that character on the show. And I was like, wow, really? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's because it's inside my... I, I, I had it... Yeah, I'm wrestling with it, right? It's, it wants to come out, but like... Pack it away. No. So, okay. So Easter egg, if you want to go back to last week's rebroadcast, which is episode 162, you get to hear Rob break into that character during the episode. <laughs> You're going to love it. Uh, but before we do that, we got to thank some more people who make this show possible. Uh, so in about two minutes, we're going to do final thought. Um, but first, take a break, talk about a few things that we, uh, some people we want to thank, some people who make the show possible, and that's us. We make things. And uh, I make a comic, which I've been talking about a lot today, uh, Boulder and Fleet at boulderandfleet.com. However, uh, you know, what is it? It's about it's about a bear and a bird who go on adventures, and it's my exploration of action adventure storytelling, but exploring the idea of where where does the role of force happen in adventure? Right? Does force need to happen in order to have an adventure? That's part of the thing I'm exploring with the characters. But it's animals and people, clothes, doing people things. But I'm doing a sale, which is actually this week only. Um, this ends September 30th, so reward for listening to the show early. Um, if you go to my Patreon at patreon.com slash jersey, uh, you can get my new mini-comic, A Friendly Game, which we talked about a couple episodes ago, the whole process of making this mini-comic, has a letterpress cover. Um, there's the cover right there. It's beautiful. It turned out pretty nice. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, when you feel the, the, the title, there's like a little bit of an embossing going on because it's letterpress. And then there's also a, like a little first edition stamp in the back, which is like, like a nice embossing thing. Um, but this is the latest, the, my new mini comic, A Friendly Game, which is um, you know a story about bullying chickens and uh, sentient swamp monsters and uh, playing a game called Five Stone. But if you sign up for my Patreon at the uh, $7 level, and there's actually a, let me find the link to it in the sidebar. It's right here. Team mini comic, one week only. Seven dollars. Uh, if you're outside of the United States or outside of North America, rather, it's fourteen. Sorry, I did a, I did an estimate on uh, overseas shipping, and that's just what I'm up against. Um, I will send this to you, but you will also get the first, the next like twenty two orders. There's twenty two left. The silk screened cover of a friendly game, which we chronicled in episode two hundred six. Um, 
called. That oh, no, is also awesome. Uh, that has a whole story there. behind it. Yes. So I, I, it turns out that the time we did that recording, I couldn't get these covers to dry. And then my wife, Anne, found a story about butlers who ironed newspapers so that their gentlemen could read the newspaper with white gloves without fear of getting the ink on their fingers. And so Anne said, did you try heat setting the ink? And I was like, oh, my gosh. No, I didn't. So I got a heat gun, and I ran the heat gun on top of these covers. And now I can run my fingers on them. No ink on here, Mom. So, yes, I have 22 copies left of this, which you will get with the letterpress version. And I'm never making this again. I'm never making this edition again. So if you're into collector's items, this will be one, presuming that my career <laughs> warrants anything that I've ever done being called a collector's item. But, it, you know, it's a cool-looking cover. You know? And it'll be your artifact of my creative journey that I went through as chronicled in episode 205. Your humble disclaimer aside, this is amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, patreon.com slash jersey and uh, boulderandfleet.com. So, Rob, you make a game. And let me pull up your game because we can actually do a Ooh. live demo on the show. Super Here we cool. go. What's that game called? Uh, the game is called This Panda Needs You. And it's all about you're you know the this panda that while well, you're like hey i what why am i doing here helping this thing out and, and it's well it's cute it's nice the, the panda's you know do mind it's own, minding its own business encounters a stack of blocks and then the blocks get knocked over and this is where the panda needs you do put things back right put you know solve this puzzle it's a physics block stacking game it's very mellow and it's like the, this panda celebrates as you're making progress putting things right dancing along playing some happy music and there's like over 50 levels that get progressively, you know, more and more challenging. And then it's, it's great for people of all ages. It's about all about some, you know, pattern matching and you can learn more about it at this dash panda.com. And well, of course it's available for iPhone, iPad, Android phones and tablets. And um, it's actually available for uh, Mac and windows desktop as well. Mac and Windows, you can go to itch.io and look for this dash panda. This panda needs you. And um, for Android, go to the Google Play Store. For iOS, go to, of course, the iTunes App Store. Oh, can I get and it looks like oh. Jersey's, Jersey's figuring out the, the first, like, um, first, you know, challenging level. The, the challenge builds up when you've got these. Oh, I exper- did it. <laughs> Boom, you did it. Nice work. <laughs> So um, supposing that you're really more into, you know, the way we think about stuff rather than the stuff that we make, fair enough. This show is a, a side gig that we do. It's a s- side project. And uh, you can find out, we can get more products that we make that are like this show at leanintoart.com slash workshops. If you haven't checked them out yet, there's video workshops you can download. I've got comics workshops there. Rob's got making video games from comics, storytellers, UI tools, leanintoart.com slash workshops. If, you know, You've engaged all this stuff. You've you know purchased this panda. You've uh, signed up for my Patreon to get the the mini comics, or you know you've read Boulder and Fleet. Um, what else can I do? I think you can do right now. If you're watching the video on YouTube, you can give it a thumbs up. That helps more people discover the show. Raises our rankings in search on a very important uh, search tool, YouTube. Uh, another thing you do is if you're listening to this uh, is an audio podcast, going to your favorite podcatcher like iTunes, giving the show a five star review. Uh, even writing a few words about it would be greatly appreciated. Costs you nothing but a few minutes of your time. We thank everybody who has been doing that. It means a lot to us. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm for the final thought, Rob. Okay. Final thought. Now, side projects, it sounds, it's, I, I think that there's a lot of this stuff that, that people go through as, as you do, right? When someone when when some character shows up the first time you fall in love and they're like you know there's a lot of complexity in relationships and you know be be thoughtful and you know listen to your partner and do all this I, you're just like shut up i'm in love i'm happy but this doesn't you make no sense old man so that could be your summary of this a whole episode <laughs> but <laughs> If you're curious to say like, well, yeah, is there something, is there something to this? Like maybe there's a compatible takeaway or, or so in here. Like we've got the, 
it's not it's not trivial to to include the idea of like what's sustainable for you um and like what are you expecting out of this this side project that's um it's worth asking that and just like it's you know it's uh you know when you're already in love with your project and you're doing foolish stuff you know what can i say i've been there too i don't know um <laughs> you'll probably learn a lot you're gonna love it right <laughs> uh, the character must repress anyway <laughs> how are you doing jersey what kind of things what what kind of <laughs> what kind of takeaway do you think is the um <sighs> I'm, I'm 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 keeping it in man Just yeah i know i know <laughs> i'm so, sorry it's all good it's so fun uh, watching you struggle with it it's like he's not gonna turn into the hulk he's not gonna do it uh no i agree i agree like uh, as somebody who works with young people i feel like i'm always walking that line between like what what can i share with them that's going to be remotely useful and what information turns me into stupid old man who's like not giving them anything helpful. You ever see, there's an old um, Jim Belushi movie called Mr. Destiny. It's, it's oh. like the nineties. It's um, sounds familiar, but hmm. it's, it's, it's one of those ones where it's like, uh, uh, what, what, what's that Jimmy? Uh, it's a wonderful life where it's like, you get to see what the world would look like without you to appreciate what you have and everything. And mm. in, in that movie, Jim Belushi's character, he, he sums up, everything went wrong with his life after this one fateful baseball game when he was a little kid. Like, had he hit the ball and hit the home run, his life would have turned out totally different. He'd be like a big, successful businessman. He'd be married to a different woman. He'd have all this money and prestige and power and success, and everybody would love him. And then he gets that life. Like, this, like Michael Caine shows up. He's like, well, I'll give you that. Boom, here you go. And sure enough, he was right. But what he lost was all these other lives that he touched in his original life were so much more the worse. I'm not going to make any statements on like what that story is ultimately trying to say, but there's this one nice moment at the end where he chooses to go back to his original life. And so then Michael Caine goes to that fateful baseball game, makes him miss the ball. And then as the kid, the young character version, the kid is walking off the field at night and he's all bummed out. He's like, I lost the game is the best, most important game of my life. Michael Caine's in the stands and he says like, you know what? Life has a funny way of turning off just the way it should. I wouldn't worry about it too much. And the kid looks up, he's like, yeah, I guess so. And then as he's walking away, he's like, stupid old man, was he? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long way to get to that, but I worry about being that guy sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, okay. And then honestly, every single one of us who's doing this kind of thing, and I'm quite confident that folks who listen to our, our show, the leaners out there are, they're in a similar boat dealing with their own, their own side projects and, and picking up, um, you know, those, those, the lessons from experience along the way that, that are, I don't know, I, may, may or may not be transferable. But and to go back to your love metaphor one more time, I'm going to use a quote from Carl Sagan. Someone once asked him why he goes around doing all this work to a, you know, promote science to people and he's like, well when you're in love you want to tell the whole world well if you're in love having the language to explain why and not just sputter because they're awesome that's all um tends to be helpful uh not, not only for you but for other people and asking yourself a little bit of why every once in a while um becomes a useful tool for when suddenly you start to experience that burnout am i falling out of love or am i just burning out what what, what signals am i getting here and how can i act on those signals I find that stuff useful too. And you know, something you had in your notes, Rob, that we didn't cover in the show is this sort of time tracking organizational stuff is something, these are habits you picked up a long time ago um, and have been refining over the years. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. Then uh, yeah, having, having some kind of, um, some kind of way to, to not just have my only, exchange to just be going in and diving into the work and this is common lots of folks do some kind of project or task management but then um it's it's something where i noticed that uh leaving behind some trail of like well where what have i finished and and where do i need to go next and it's the, it's it's super encouraging um and it can get 
yet also like you, you could find a system that works for you for some chunk of time, maybe a long chunk of time. And then maybe, maybe it doesn't somehow feel right anymore. And, uh, then that becomes another thing to experiment with. And that's that, that's actually something I am currently exploring. Um, and I want to throw in at the end of that is you may have been doing this for a long time. I haven't. Um, hmm. and I've come up against situations where I made myself ill by just diving in and doing the work and sort of just plowing ahead. Even when, you know, like I was getting signals that this is not sustainable what I'm doing. I had to actually break down and I've lost relationships. I've had friendships fall apart because of this, where I have looked somebody in the eye and said like, I loved this before I loved you, you know, mm. <laughs> which isn't the healthiest, most wonderful thing to say to another human being, you know? Um, and what was talking there? There was a pressure talking there. There was a tension talking there that I wasn't attending to properly. So this is something I had to pick up after the, like down the road. And I wish I would have been doing it along uh, earlier on in my career. I would have probably had a lot more healthy interactions. Earlier on. So, and I think if, if there's like a big takeaway, it's like um, it's, it's professing a desire for, um, for others to explore the, this, this kind of, um, having a having an approach where you're like i've had failed projects that have been just big emotional baggage right and like a like not just one or two like a, like a good handful and it's it's actually it's, I, it's for me i found it helpful to say like well what ha what what did i what were my assumptions going into this what did i expect coming out of it and then later on you know shaping that into like well I think I have new tools and process now to try to not repeat that same thing. And so now I can take on projects differently and then stack that up over time. And I have, um, I have refined my approach and that's, uh, just with a variety of things that we've shared throughout this episode too. So this is, um, hmm. like, like a, like a big endorsement to saying like, um, your emotion, the, the tensions and stuff that come up, they're real. And hopefully there's a, like you find your own way to engage with them in a, uh, in a constructive manner, right? That, that, um, it, because I, I, I've, I've thrown myself at projects where I wasn't getting the most out of me nor the project. And that's, yeah, I guess I don't wish that on anybody. And if there was even a tiny thing useful here, then Hopefully, hopefully that can, can help someone not do that. That's great. I think we walked around it. Um, cool. All right. Thank you for this discussion, Rob. Uh, this, was, this was a fun, fun walk. And um, speaking of discussions and podcasting, uh, it just occurred to me now that September 2017 marks, I've been doing this podcasting stuff for 10 years as of this month. And I don't want to make any bigger fuss out of it than that. It's just like, whoa, what? A decade? It's been a decade now. I've been on a regular basis sitting behind a microphone talking about storytelling. That's crazy pants. That's really awesome. Congratulations, man. Thanks, I guess. I've I learned a lot. Work, this is like, yeah, you're, you're really great at this, and it's fun working with you. So. Back at you. Um, so Congrats. we do the show Thursday. Wait, first, sorry, like, so uh, first what? podcast, can anyone find that? Oh, it's, it should be easy enough to find. Okay. Is that art and story number one? Art and story number one, September of 20, 2007. Um, uh, Saturday Supercast started shortly after that. Sweet. Uh, but yeah, you can find them on iTunes still to this day. And I still get emails from people who are discovering it for the first time. Uh, and it's pretty cool that uh, that's, that show continues to be useful to people. Uh, although I kind of wonder, like, what did I even talk about 10 years ago? <laughs> Uh, I'll have to go back and listen to it sometime <laughs> if I can. Um, okay, well, but this show, the show I'm doing now is my favorite one, and we do it every Thursday uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We stream it live on YouTube, and then we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash lena to art and lena to art.com, which is the the prompt for me to say, I have been Jersey Drozd, and you can find me on Instagram at Jersey Drozd. And I am Rob Stenzinger, and you can find me on Instagram and Twitter as at Rob Stenzinger. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. 
You can also follow us on Twitter at the user Lean Into Art, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to shut the stream down. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Thank you. Good night.